Same as always, guys, just be careful of the computer behind you. Don't want it falling down.
example, there's the jerk. Deposit eight hundred thousand. Andrea Park wakes up and walks downstairs to make breakfast for her family of three. No, Mrs. Park embraces her daughter Sydney, kisses her on the forehead, and tells her that she loves her. Now, Mrs. Park couldn't know this would be the last time she could hug her daughter, but it was. Mrs. Park couldn't know this would be the last time she would tell her daughter that she loved her. But it was in the future because, unfortunately, Sydney Park is dead. She was killed by a gunshot wound to the head. And who was holding the gun? None other than her neighbor, someone who was supposed to be her friend, Jesse Durant. Now, why did this happen? What could have been done to prevent it? Who is responsible? Members of the jury, today we will endeavor to answer this question for you. You'll be shown a real world adage that we all know to be true that violence breeds violence. In Duran, read the violence that we see here today, that we are still dealing with today. How, you might ask? By allowing the child, Jesse, unrestricted access to gruesomely violent video games. But not only did Ms. Duran permit Jesse to play these games, she purchased them for him. For him. She played them. Today, we will call three witnesses. First, Andrea Park, Sydney's own mother. Mrs. Park will bravely take the stand today and be asked to relive the most traumatic day of her entire life. Faith, I would wish on no one. Second, we will call Danny Brooks. Mr. Brooks was a babysitter for the parks, and he will testify to just how often Jesse would ask specifically to see the park gun. Finally, we would call Dr. Campbell Sullivan, a member for the American uh, Board for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and an expert in this field. Now, not only will Dr. Solo testify as to how Jesse exhibited multiple warning signs that Hayden Durant should have been aware of, he will also, also speak specifically to the effect that violent media has on a developing brain. Now, we have the burden today. We must prove to you by a preponderance of the evidence that Hayden Durant is liable for negligent parental supervision. Now, all that means is that, that you conclude that this tragedy could have been avoided were it not for Hayden's actions. We will ask you to find her liable. At the end of this trial today, my co-counsel, Mrs. Miller, will stand before you. And if, after hearing all the evidence and testimony, you conclude that had Hayden not bred Jeff's violence in Jesse, by allowing him to play these gruesome, violent video games. Had he not bred violence in Jesse by allowing, not punishing him at every turn, that had he not bred violence in Jesse by allowing him to take his obsession with firearms from the gaming console to reality, then she will instruct you to find Hayden Durant. May it please the court, counsel, members of the jury. A gun is as dangerous as the 
home was kept in. Now the plaintiff just came before you and told you a story about the tragic events of August 18, 2010. A single gunshot that shattered both the parks and Duran's northern lives. A single gunshot that killed 11-year-old Sidney Park in the park home. And when such a tragic event happens, it becomes hard not to think with your heart. There may be parts of today's trial where that's all you want to do. But you need to be strong and think of the evidence, not the emotion. I will not ask you to do this because it's easy. We're we'll asking you to do this because it's right. Now, like I said, the plaintiff came up here and told you a story. They didn't tell you the whole story. They didn't tell you that the gun and the danger that killed Sydney Park were in the park home the whole time. On August 18, 2010, the only other person in the house with Sydney Park was her best friend, another child. These two children were able to get a hold of a handgun kept in the park home. These two children were able to find bullets for this gun, and these two children were able to load it. And today you will learn how this led to the death of City Park in her own home. Now these are not suggestions intended to sway you one way or another. This is what is going to be established today as fact. Members of the jury, before I go any further, this is not about guns being dangerous. This is about guns being dangerous in the wrong hands. In a child's hands. And members of the jury, in today's trial, the plaintiff has the burden. It will never shift. It will never lessen. And what this means is that they must show you through a preponderance of the evidence that Aiden Durand is liable. But even if they do that, it's still not enough. Because today, the defense is taking what is called an affirmative defense. And what this means is that if at the end of today's trial, you believe that Andy Park was liable, was negligent, or didn't store her gun properly, not find Andy Durand liable. But you don't just have to take my word for it. You will hear from Hayden Durand, the mother of Jesse, about how time after time after time she talked to her son. She told him about how guns are dangerous, about how violence is sad. You will hear from Ash DeRosa a gun expert with 21 years of experience about the alarming circumstances that the parks kept their gun. That having a combination to the safe that holds a gun as easy as theirs, like locking your house or leaving a key in the door. And you will hear from the only other person that was there on August 18th with Sydney Park, Jesse Durant, and how he heard from his mother time after time after time about the dangers of guns, about to never play with guns, and that on that day, on August 18, how easy it was to get into the park's gun safe, about how easy it was to find the bullets, and they started playing the game they didn't understand the consequences to it. Now, members of the jury, at the end of today's trial, my co-counsel, Emma Allen, will come up here and tell you the same thing I have. A gun is only as dangerous as the home it is kept in. And she will ask you to do the only thing that speaks justice and find Aiden Durant not liable. Thank you.
before we proceed, I understand you're pursuing negligent grounds for this. Uh, yes, Your Honor. I have a complaint for intentional shooting. Sydney and Jesse, were they very close? Extremely. They stood together almost every day. Things you could see and do. They played a lot of games, talking about what they did, especially over the years. Did you have a policy concerning what video games Sydney was and not allowed to play? Yes. Sydney was only allowed to play video games because she was having a good game. And she tried to play a video game in the middle of the day and she would have to check it out first. She would have to see if her body was lost in the end of it. And we would see if it was lost in our bedroom and watch it. Why was this a policy? Video games are supposed to make people die to help catch your daughter and develop these mad friends. So we're here today for a charge of, or a claim of negligent claim of supervision against my client. Ms. Park's uh, discussion about video games and the policy concerning video games don't go to that fact one way or another, and they're not relevant. I'll just run. Uh, Your Honor, they're absolutely relevant. We're pursuing a negligent parental supervision case theory uh, with regard to video games. I'm simply trying to establish the difference between the way Ms. Park uh, handles video games and the way Ms. Park Are we going to hear the people that? Would you like me to repeat the question, Mr. Clark? Why was this your policy uh, concerning what video games did you allow me to not allow to play? Video games did you allow me to not allow to play? Video games did you allow me to not allow to play? Now, to the best of your knowledge, did Hayden Durant share this outlook? 
Now, on August of 2010, you spoke to the actual work. You were sure that you told me everything you could remember about what was happening leading up to that day.
Officer Williams, on August 18th, you were in charge of the scene at the park home. Yes, sir. Um, I was a ranking officer at the time. Uh, all the other were just heard. 
and being in charge of the scene, you're in charge of preserving the scene. Uh, it's one of the many duties that I have for the And at the scene of the Far Coma on station, there were multiple people coming in and out of the house. Several personnel. There were paramedics. Two validators in the car park and have to go to the scene. There were your fellow patrol officers. Never been. And you said that it was only essential personnel? Yes, sir. That would, would Andy Park be considered essential personnel? Absolutely, sir. He was one of them. You said that, uh, is it your testimony today that you believe that Andy Park belonged in the park home? I don't believe that she should have been able to go into the living room where her child was still laying down, but I found it all just had her back on And Katie Duran was in the park home as well. Yes, sir. And Terry Chapin was in the park home as well? He was supposed to do it um, around the work business. In your own words, it's common sense to have less people in a scene to preserve it. Except for the essential personnel. Yes or no, common sense to have less person or to less people at a scene. Yes, it's common sense. You also did several interviews and talked about on direct examination. Yes, sir. You interviewed Andy Park. Yes, sir. And you asked her several different questions about the gun safe and the gun. Rather routine questions on a routine basis. And you asked her who had access to the gun. Yes, sir. And she told you it was only Andy who She told me Then, after a few more questions, you asked her if uh, Sydney Park knew where the gun was. And she told you on August 17th, the day before the shooting, Sydney approached her about the gun. She approached her about the gun. Mrs. Park said that Sydney knew that it was in the bedroom. And Andy Park did you use the gun? You also asked her about the location of their bullets. Yes, sir. And she told you that she kept them on a high shelf in the garage. Yes, sir. But when you were performing a search of the home, you found them on top of the safe. I first heard them on top of the safe. That was. And you don't know who fired the gun on August 18th, 2010, do you? Um, I'm familiar with the investigation. Yes. But you don't know. You don't know if the gun went off on accident. You don't know if Jesse Duran pulled the trigger. Thank you. 
Objection, Your Honor, they have the character evidence uh, saying that Jesse Duran, she didn't like babysitting Jesse Duran because of his attitude, because of a certain reason. Uh, this goes directly to uh, the, this uh, actually performing the arrest of Jesse Duran, making it more or less likely that he was to shoot City Park or that Hayden Duran uh, negligent led to the shooting of City Park. Uh, Your Honor, pursuant to Rule 12, for B, we're not offering this for a propensity argument for Jackie Duran's character, but rather to show that the defendant, Ms. Duran, had knowledge. And if I will proffer, it will come to light that Ms. Brooks talked to Hayden Duran about the way her son acted when Dan Gaines died. But only asserting her knowledge and her work. Why did you particularly love to babysit? Now, can you teach some to Gary what one does when they play Call of Duty? Oh, um, Call of Duty, I would say, first person shooter is the next player on our own. Um, then the shooter goes to their attackers, so you can tell them to make sure you can shoot people. Yeah. Did you ever talk to Ms. Duran about this behavior? Yeah, I did. I was in a conversation with her and asked if she was going to do that. Even if it's not in there, she would say things like, they're just playing, that's what children do, etc. Was there a specific instance that happened with Jesse Duran that made you feel the need to talk to Ms. Duran? Yeah, there was just one more time. Um, I remember they were getting into the test of the shooting. I'm going to shoot you for me as long as you want. And it happened. Now, Ms. Brooks, were you aware that the park? Did you ever ask Mrs. Park for the combination Telling Danny Brooks about the uh, the gun safe and their lack of uh, sharing the combination. Uh, Your Honor, this is going to be a test on the listener and be a test on Ms. Brooks as to who knew the combination was safe. Did she do anything as a result of uh, No, she didn't. It was to her previous statement as to her asking for the combination in case anything happened in an emergency. And then Ms. Uh, Park told her that only he and Danny knew the combination was safe. And then Ms. Brooks could then uh, see that it was only them that could get into the safe in case anything happened in the emergency. Uh, yes, uh, this goes directly to the truth of the matter asserted, not the effect on the listener, sh uh, showing that the parts were not willing to show their uh, combination with other people, uh, not to the effect of what Danny Brooks subsequently did. A motion to strike. Ms. Brooks, did you have any indication that Jesse Duran knew there was a gun in the park couple? Yeah, I remember the attitude of the and I don't want the gun, I want the gun. I was kind of confident that she was talking about and she was trying to say something that was born, but it's kind of weird thing that she wanted to say. Did you ever again try to talk to Mrs. Duran about Jesse? Uh, response to uh, the 
her telling her about the gun and not wanting to do anything. This goes directly to the action of performing it with, of uh, making it more likely that uh, the events leading up to August 18, 2010, uh, were her fault. What's the character here? Uh, that she ignored statements and warnings about Jesse Duran. Uh, Your Honor, it's my understanding that uh, character trait is admissible when it goes to the major claim in today's case, and our claim is the defendant's actions or lack thereof were the direct and proximate cause of Sidney Park's death, and therefore the fact that she had this knowledge and didn't do anything about it goes to that claim. Do you have a response to score body? Uh, I would say that this goes to the action of form that it is not admissible when it's not the case. On direct examination, you talked a lot about just talking with Ms. Duran about Jesse's behavior. But you also talked about parts about Jesse's behavior as well. There were several different occasions that you mentioned to the public about it. You said what you believe to be Jesse's bullying Sydney. And you told the parts about this? Yeah. And after this, Andy and Lisa said, like, let me run out of the park home. Yeah. Yeah. After what you call Jesse screaming at Cindy, you told the parts about this? And after this, they still love Jesse from over. And after Jesse yelled at Sid that he shot her, you pulled the parts about this. After you told them all this that you were concerned with, that you still came over. Yeah. Now, you talked about Jesse asking about the gun. Sydney asked about the gun as well. Sydney said that she wanted to see the gun and said. And she said that she knew they kept it in the bedroom. And he didn't tell the parts about it. Now, Monica 17, you were with the park, or you were at the park with her. Yeah. And Jesse and Sydney were playing. Yeah. And they said that, and they started talking about the real gun. Yeah. Now, Ms. Clark, do you remember being interviewed by Claire Williams after the event of August 18th? Do you remember him asking you about the bullets that the parts kept in your home? Um, yes or no, do you remember Officer Williams talking to you about the, the bullets stored in the parts home? Do you remember him specifically asking whether they were stored on a high 
my shelf and your garage? A few weeks before this, you actually went into the garage. Yeah, I was on the When you look on the high shelf, but you didn't see the bullet. Tell us if the bullets were on top of the face. You couldn't tell us if the bullets were in the safe. Most certainly. What 
Your Honor, at this time I reject the letter to discipline on grounds that it is hearsay to an outward statement that is being used to prove the evil. Dr. Solo, what do you notice, 
Good evening, Dr. Solo. My name is Leonard Terry Capo, and I have a few questions for you. Uh, you work as a psychiatrist, correct? Correct. Right. And you own your own firm? Yes. But you don't have any publications within the field of psychology. I don't have any publications. Um, one of the reasons that I left the state was because it's quite getting me to write. I really hate writing, so I don't have any publications in my own. Or edit people's work and help them write their own publications. And you are here today to answer two questions. The first two questions down. The first you said on direct examination was to see if Jeffrey posed a special danger with respect to firearms. Correct. And in coming to that conclusion, you relied on what you called the mad method. Correct? Yes, uh, the mad method is and the MAD method shows three of the six risk factors that you would look for when assessing a violence in children. Yes, uh, when you look at the six factors, there's many tests you can use, and the main test that most psychologists use is the MAD method, which is media violence, aggression, and the test of the firearm are the most likely to not only be existed, but just the biggest influence on the criminal subject. So on that test, Jesse Duran would have scored a 50%, correct? Uh, I will tell you that another test, uh, including all six, will say he would have been able to get the But you didn't use another test, Dr. Solo. Uh, this was the test that I used. Now, in assessing these risk factors, you relied on the notification of student discipline, correct? Uh, that was one of the uh, materials that I looked at. And uh, you remember talking about this document on direct examination? Yes. Uh, you're familiar, as you testified, that it, it, it involved Jesse Duran, involved in a crisis situation at his school, correct? Correct. And you didn't interview the teacher who witnessed this event, did you? Um, no, it was the teacher, which was the notification. You didn't think it would be necessary to speak with the person. 
person who saw this witness, uh, this incident unfold? Correct. Is that true? Was this one that there was clearly this is an altercation? Now that's just so that we all know what to say about what happens when you're in things. You didn't interview any part, except for the initial interview with her, correct? That's correct. You look at her statement? Yes. You didn't think it was necessary to ask her any questions outside of what she had already written down? Now, all the relevant information was included in the statement that I reviewed at Kenny Park. I feel a psychology generally we don't need to interview outside people. Outside it's outside people. Any other interviews besides this trip. So you don't think it was necessary to interview the mother of Jesse Green? Correct. You didn't think it was necessary to interview Jesse Green himself? Correct. I feel the psychology peer review that we don't really need to interview him. Because of the statement that I put So you don't need to interview. The person you're here giving medical diagnosis about, you didn't think it was relevant to interview Danny Brooks, the babysitter, and you didn't need to get her statement, or you didn't her statement, okay? Correct. But you didn't think it was relevant to interview her. So it's going to be pretty clear you don't really need to face to face contact to come to conclusions with the psychologist, which is what multiple So uh, I'd like to touch upon another pertinent thing that you relied on coming to your conclusion. Violence in the media. Do you remember speaking of this on direct examination? Of course. Violence in the media shall touch and influence the child balance. And on direct examination, you told the members of the jury that parents have a responsibility. Correct? Yes. They have a responsibility to monitor their child with violence in the media. Yes, parents can definitely not have the media violence that they see. So you're familiar with Katie Duran on multiple occasions speaking with her son about his violence in the media that she Yes, I'm familiar with some of the things she did last week with her son, Jesse Duran. Jesse Duran responds to her as no child in the children that was not enough. Now, Dr. Solo, you're familiar that Hayden Durant told her son, Jesse, guns are dangerous. Correct. Jesse, guns are not toys. Yes. I'd like to touch on one last thing, Dr. Solo. You even commend Hayden Durant for not buying her son any of the fake toy controllers for his video game, correct? Yes. I would say that she did make some attempts to limit the amount of violent media exposure, and she said that she said it should have been more. But that's a yes, she did buy, she did, she you commend her for not buying these toilet controllers for his video game. Yes, and that was her own opinion. Well, I know it was. Quickly, you guys, Your Honor. Now, Dr. Solo, did you ask to interview Jesse Lunar? Yes, I was not allowed to. Did you ask to interview Jesse Lunar? Would you like to
So, uh, I send
box the day before it rains. Yes, sir. 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 Y
Yes, Your Honor, I would object to this document under Rule 403 that is substantially more prejudicial than it is for the man. I'm referring specifically to the search of their cell, they had 17 men. After this search, we see a dash and a list. We don't know what the remainder of these statements were. Now, I expect that the plaintiff will assert that this is talking about a real gun, but we don't know if Jackson was searching how to load a gun in the video game. We don't know why he searched the scene. And because of that, it's substantially more prejudicial in focus as it would cause the jury to assume that Jesse Duran was searching about how to load the part from the revolver, and we simply don't know that. Yes, Your Honor, I believe that dash appears at the end of all searches on the executive paper, and it's stated that that was going to be the last search of Jesse Duran. So that would suggest that that was the end of Jesse's search, and there was nothing on that sheet of paper that you could type in specifically, but he was accused of doing so. On that ground, it's the same. So Jesse, at 7-18, I believe, is correct me if I'm wrong, he searched how to load a revolver. Objection, Your Honor. Your Honor, sorry, the rule is that this document is not admissible. We're saying you're wrong. Let's move ahead to the occurrences of the parking lot. Sidney was the one who was arrested in this case. And you checked the revolver to see if it was unloaded. And it was unloaded? And I believe that the indicated code taken, code was the one that was going to be demonstrated on the next page. Right after we get down to the first time, I'll get it done for you. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And then Jesse wants to, Sidney wants to go out and get these drugs. And after Sidney pointed the gun at you and said, he split the gap in half. And you picked up the gun. And it felt a little bit different. And then Mr. Duran, I believe you popped open the cylinder, just as you had before. Which I did with the cylinder. Oh, you just checked the cylinder. It's part of the rules of roulette. You can have to spin the cylinder to get close. And you see it spinning. And then you pointed the gun at Sidney's head. And you closed one eye at Sidney's head. And you shot Sidney with the next bullet. Objection, Your Honor. It's more prejudicial than probative. We've heard your question. And you told the jury that. Yes, I did. And Your Honor, please stand. Here you go. Mr. Duran, you have the floor. Your Honor, the defense calls Dr. Ashley Durosa. May I proceed? You may. State your name for the court. Good evening. I'm Dr. Ashley Durosa. What do you do for a living, Dr. Durosa? Well, I'm a gun safety expert, and I've been doing that for about 20 years. And in the past 12 years, I've also been teaching at Liberty State University, while coaching our young leaders in electric softball and boxing. 
where did you go to school? I got my master's degree from Tufts University. Before attending the Wayne State, where I earned my doctorate in public policy and management, with further focus on gun violence and gun Have you testified in court before? Well, I've been retained on the state previous cases, and I've testified to those cases. And has any of your research ever been published? Well, in my 20 years in the field, I've published a lot of study articles, including one titled Future Gun Search, a way to prevent. Now, Dr. DeRoso, why are you here testifying in court? I am a reporter by Ms. Kim Jones and asked to evaluate how the question is for the gun leading up to the surrounding information on all the cases and questions. Without telling us what your conclusions are, were you able to form any? Yes, I was. What materials did you rely on in forming your conclusions? Besides my past experience in school, I relied on the information in the front of the park, the city of Iran, the park city of the city of the and then pictures and diagrams of the city of Now, what methods did you use in your investigation? I relied on the bulk case for evaluation method, as well as gathering the data. And are these methods reliable? And did you apply these methods reliably to the facts before you? Yes, sir. Dr. DeRosa, before we talk about how the parks stored their gun, I'd like to speak with you about owning a gun in general. Is owning a gun safe? Well, the gun owners do not have on mind, which means that keeping a gun accessible and safe is something that's behind the gun, but also preventing it from falling into unwanted hands. What risks? can be associated with owning a gun. The greatest risk is somebody who's not trained or even a child putting a holster back on. And if I were a gun owner, Dr. DeRosa, how would I go about minimizing those risks? Well, I would advise you, as I advise all my clients, to follow the three prep system and make a safe store of prep. There is going to be purchase of quality safe, use for the ammunition that will be in the firearm, and most importantly, you have both a secure and a memorized and Doctor, would you be able to explain these safe storage steps to the members of the jury here today? I would, and I brought down the case that we did. Your Honor, I ask that Dr. DeRosa be allowed to step down and use a whiteboard with these steps already written down on them to explain them to the members of the jury. No objection, Your Honor. Doctor, what are we looking at here? There are two things you can probably step for the same storage steps that I would advise any client to take for properly stored guns at home. Let's take these one at a time. Why is the first step, you have your gun in a safe, secure location, an important step? Well, very simply, this step can prevent tragedy. By purchasing a quality safe and keeping it in a secure location, you prevent anyone who has an experience in how to use a firearm from getting access to it. And why is the second step, keeping the bullets stored separately from the gun, an important step? Well, for home defense, it can be very tempting to store your firearm and ammunition all day in the cylinder. But again, if it were to fall in the wrong hands, it could just add to tragedy or potentially happen. Now, how about the third step in these safe storage steps? Why is having a secure, memorized combination an important step? Well, a secure combination simply refers to something that couldn't be easily guessed, such as an anniversary or a birthday or you dress your child at home. Just something that no one close to you would be able to know. Why is having a secure combination an important step? Well, it prevents the safe from being easily breached. But most importantly, it's to have it memorized. And let me clarify that in my field, when we say memorized, we simply refer to something not being written down. Doctor, I'd like to turn your attention to the parks and how they stored their gun leading up to the incident on August 18th. We'll go through these steps one at a time. 
Did the parks follow the first step, having it quality safe before they're done? Well, Park Canyon purchased the Gamichi space, which is Pablo Lani. However, they chose to keep the space within their master bedroom, which didn't have a lock on the door and was easily accessible for the daughter. But I can't fault them for purchasing one of that space on the market. How about the second step? Did the parks follow this one? I read conflicting reports as to whether the bullets were stored in the safe, on top of the safe, or elsewhere entirely, so I can't be sure as to whether or not they followed this step. What about the third step, Dr. DeRosa? Did the parks follow this one? Well, unfortunately, the park's accommodation to their gun safe was just the park didn't per se. Someone putting a family member or a close friend with him in the home. So unfortunately, no, the accommodation was not secure. And uh, during the sweep of the park's home and in my report, I reviewed the specific paper with the cover on which the accommodation had been written down. And although I can't state whether or not the student's memory, in my field, it was not considered memorized. Did it appear that the park's written, or the park's, excuse me, state accommodation had been memorized? Um, no. Uh, because it was written down on a piece of paper, I can't state that it was conditioned by them in the park scene. Now, Dr. DeRosa, who knew where this written state accommodation was found? Objection. Speculation. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Dr. DeRosa has uh, reviewed the statements of Andy Park, and um, in the documents, she is um, well aware of who knew where this combination to the safe was kept. She also reviewed the uh, file drawer where the combination was kept, and she, um, uh, and I think Rule 703, um, Facts, uh, underlying facts and data, she not only this in the same part, coming to her conclusion today. Yeah. Only that speculation, she is not allowed to speculate as to whether or not someone knew the combination at the time of it. Where the combination is not Oh, yes, Your Honor. Dr. DeRosa, did you come across anything that indicated to you where this written combination to the safe was kept? Um, yes, over the course of my investigation, uh, I found out that this combination was kept in a folder marked for emergency only, and that was kept in an unlocked file drawer in the park's unlocked desk. Dr. DeRosa, who knew where this written combination was kept? Well, based on the report that I reviewed, the gun donor in the park was aware of it, his wife, Andrea Park, and their daughter, Camille, was aware of that for all the important documents that they need to have with them. And did either Andy Park or Lady yeah. Park know that their daughter knew where this was from? Yes, he was on their part. And in your expert opinion, Dr. Dorosa, was the Park's only gun safety for? Again, I cannot fault them for purchasing this high quality safe, and I can't say whether or not they stored the ammunition carefully. But their choice to have such a simple combination and to have it written down and so easily accessible is not a choice they could throw the firearm and kind of put it off their front door and not just keep it. Your Honor, I have no further questions for Dr. Rose at this time. I'm going to ask that you would like to return to your seat. And if the opposing counsel is open, please. Whiteboard. Uh, yes, please. Dr. DeRosa, do you have any case for your testimony here today? Yes, this is on In fact, your rates were doubled to your testimony. Um, yes, this is very interesting for me. Now, you also didn't want to testify in this case, correct? Again, I would say yes. In fact, you stated in your own words you were hesitant to take this case. 
was written on um, unlabeled piece of paper. Uh, yes, this is an And you also found it commendable that the parts did not tell anyone the combination of the And you find that commendable that it wouldn't tell anyone the combination. Uh, it would be ideal for no one to tell anyone who can turn out to be a Mm -hmm. 
what they did. I just want to see the house and the impact and the beginning and the use of something like gardening. Yeah, that's 
Yes, Your Honor, this goes directly to the then existing mental plan or intent to keep her child safe, to keep the other children safe in a house with a gun, and that would fall under Rule 8033 in the section of the case. Do you have a response to My response would be, Your Honor, that the title of this conversation, the contact name is Voldemort, and there is no way, it has not been identified today that Voldemort is, in fact, Mrs. Duran. So authentication, do you have a response to that? Yes, Your Honor, she has already testified that she recognizes these text messages and this conversation as her own between her son. There is no question of authentication. Can you give a foundation that Voldemort is a witness before we enter the evidence? Yes, Your Honor. Feel free to re-raise those questions if you feel they don't know the foundation. What were you in your son's phone when you were there? Your Honor, I guess the defense moves to Exhibit 13 in the evidence. The defense moves to Exhibit 13. No objection, Your Honor. There's not a foundation. What did you want? Or why did you contact your son to tell him what was going on? I wanted to remind him that the guns in real life were not the same as the guns that he played with in video games. And I didn't want him to say anything like that. Do you want to start to agree? Yes. I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Publish for the day. How did you find out what happened on August 18th, 2007? The phone call to the Taylor Police Department right after I got into work. I had to leave from home because something had happened. What happened when you arrived at your home? There was an emergency vehicle that had been returned to my parents' place. There was a gun that was found. Four people were screaming. What happened when you took the car phone? What happened next? He was being chased. He was being chased. He was being described to the police. I thought for him to be released. Thank you. No further questions. You didn't have a problem buying Jackie the newest video games that came out on the market. No. Jackie always asked you for the most realistic war games. Jackie always wanted to get a real soldier in the army. At first you were reluctant to buy Jackie these video games because of the mature rating on them. Yes, I was. You were also reluctant to buy Jackie these games because they were first-person shooter games. Yes, I was able to get them by myself for a lot of people. Your son was 10 years old when you let him start playing these games. Yes. And the rating on the games was M for mature or 17 and older. Yes, but I made sure 3D was a close to the games that I bought and made sure they weren't fabulous or just a full game. Ms. Duran, the ratings on the games were 17 and older? Yes. And your son was only 10 years old? Yes. Now, on August 17th, you became aware that the parks kept a gun in their home. Yes, I had been on the park for a little while. And on the 17th, you became aware that your son knew that the parks kept a gun in their home? Yes. You also became aware that your son wanted to play with the gun that was in the park's home? That's not what he told me. He just said he wanted to play with a gun. And I told him not to play with any of the guns, especially not the one that's on the park's home. You only assumed that the parks kept their gun in their safe? Yes, but I made a promise to them to make me. I didn't have 
your own design for I thought she was better than she had for a time to be completely possible. Mr. Rand, you never asked the park how they stored the gun in their home that your son wanted to play with. No, I didn't feel like it was my place to tell the park how to store their own gun. Ms. Grant, I'm not asking you whether it was your place to tell the park how to store their gun. I'm asking whether you asked how they stored their gun. Mm -hmm. You never talked to the parks about your son wanting to play with this gun, did you? No. You never talked to the parks about their gun at all, did you? No, I, I didn't think it was my place to do that. I did. After you became aware of this information, you never threatened to punish your son if he touched the gun? No, I was very clear at the time. And time again, he never touched Always nodded. Understood. Mr. Rand, you never threatened to punish your son if he touched the gun. No. On August 18th, you instead let your son go to the park's house that contained the gun that your son wanted to play with? Yes. Objection, Your Honor. Mr. Rand, on August 18th, you let your son go to the park's home. And you let your son go to a house where a gun that he wanted to play with was stored. Your Honor, at this point, the defense rests in the case in chief, and we would simply ask for a five to ten minute recess for the closing.
Members of the jury, may it please the court. Violent, brief, violent. And hating the rain allowed violence to be dressed and get to the rain. On August 18, 2010, a tragedy occurred. Sydney Clark lost her life. Lee and Andy Clark lost their only child, their only daughter. Sydney's life was taken at the hand of her longtime best friend and neighbor, Jesse Duran. The gun that took her last breath, her parents' own weapon that they purchased after their house was broken into. The parts bought a safe and took every precaution to keep this gun away from the children, but Jesse Duran's obsession with firearms fueled him to figure out a way to get this gun. When Andy Clark kissed her daughter goodbye that morning, she never could have imagined that it would be the last time she would see her daughter alive. Andy Clark never imagined that that would be the last time she would kiss her 11-year-old daughter. Andy Clark could have never imagined that the next time she walked into her home, she would see Sydney's pink, sparkly flip-flop sticking out from a white sheet now, we as the plaintiff have brought a claim of negligent parental supervision over the defendant, Hayden Durant. And there are two things that no one in this courtroom disagrees about. The first is that Hayden Durant had custody of Jesse Durant, and the second is that Sidney Clark died. No one in this courtroom today can look at Andy Park and say that no harm has been suffered. That leaves the plaintiff three elements to prove. The first is that the defendant had a duty to exercise reasonable care over Jesse. The second is that Jesse acted negligently, recklessly, or intentionally and caused harm. And the third is that the defendant's actions were the direct and proximate cause of this harm. Proximate and foreseeable. Now, Let's walk through each of these three individually and talk about how every witness called today proved the plaintiff's charges. The first is that the defendant had a duty to exercise reasonable care and responsibility over her child. This was proof that she did not do this when you heard testimony about the video games, the violent video games, that the defendant would not only buy her child, but play with her son. Andy Park bravely took the stand today and told you that time and time and time again, she tried to talk to the defendant about the violent video games that the defendant was allowing Jesse to play and how they were contributing to his behavior. No action was ever taken. Nothing ever changed. You then heard from Officer Dale Williams, who went to the park home on two separate occasions. And the thing that stuck out most to him was the hordes and hordes of violent video games with 17 plus ratings on them. The only child that lived in that house was 11 years old. The second element we had to prove to you today was that Jesse Duran acted negligently, recklessly, or intentionally to cause harm. We heard from Jesse himself that he picked up the gun, opened the cylinder, spun it, closed it, closed his left eye, and took aim at Sidney Clark's head. The third is that the defendant's actions, or lack thereof, were the direct and proximate cause of this harm. You heard from Dr. Campbell Solo, who told you that Jesse Duran exhibited the three major warning factors when it came to media violence and the presence of firearms. 
You also heard from Dr. Campbell Solo that Jesse exhibited all the signs of a potentially violent child, and the defendant ignored all of those signs. You then heard from the defendant herself. She knew that there was a gun in the park home. She knew that Jesse wanted to play with it. She knew Jesse was obsessed with firearms, and instead of saying no, like a responsible parent, or talking to the park, she chose not to do anything at all and let Jesse go back to the park home that day. Dr. Ashley DeRosa took the stand today. Dr. DeRosa's rates were doubled, and she came here to prove a point to gun owners. Dr. DeRosa was hired solely to put the blame on Mrs. Park for the death of her child. But Mrs. DeRosa admitted that the Parks acted admirably by never telling anyone the combination of the safe. That the Parks stored their safe in a reasonable place in their bedroom. And that she commended the Parks for never telling anyone the combination. Now, we aren't saying that any child who touches a violent video game or watches a violent show will become violent. We aren't even saying it's wrong, but we are saying that Jesse was spiraling out of control with his obsession and the defendant had a duty to see these signs and take action. But instead, she did that. Now, the burden of proof today rests with the plaintiff. And we have to prove to you that it is more likely than not that the defendant's actions were the cause of harm to Sidney Park. If you think that even on one occasion the defendant did not act like a reasonable and responsible parent, you must find Mr. Rand liable. If you believe that the steady stream of media violence the defendant was supplying Jesse Duran led to Jesse's behavior on that day, you must find Mrs. Duran liable. Violence breeds violence. And the defendant, Hayden Duran, exposed Jesse to this media violence. And the defendant bred violence in Jesse Duran. Therefore, we ask you to find Mr. Duran liable. Members of the jury. A gun is only as dangerous as the gun that is kept in. Now, every one of these working accessories that were happening in this park, obviously, it was a 2010 and terrible tragedy. My hearts go out to Andrea and the park for the loss. She was a negligent parent. 
transparent, and that's what caused the death of Sidney Clark. But what they didn't want to talk about was that for years, Sidney and Jesse were good friends. They grew up together, they went to school together, they played together, and from the time those children were born, they did everything together. And Mrs. Clark, she sat on that stand herself and she told you that on August 17th, the day before Sidney's death, her daughter asked her where the combination was. And Mrs. Clark, she heard her daughter say that she knew that the gun was in the bedroom. Like, just like that. Like all of that. The next day, she drove away. She did not call She left those two children alone with a gun that she knew they wanted to play with. on that chair, and he told you that Sydney, as soon as her mother left, walked into a room and pulled out a combination out of the file drawer. She laughed when she saw it. She knew that that was the combination, and her and Jesse, they walked into that room with that safe, that unlocked room with that safe, and they used that combination to open the safe. Okay. Those children were able to get to a gun and load it. They were able to open a gun safe, take out a gun, and play with it. And that is in the park. And because of that, because they were able to get to that gun, because they were able to put a bullet in that gun, that is the reason the park is dead. There is absolutely no question. The death of a child, any child, the death of Sidney Park is an awful tragedy. One of the way it happens is everything. And when tragedies like this happen, it's really natural that we look for someone to blame. That person. And when the plaintiff looked for somebody to explain, they put Andy Park on that stand, and she tried to tell you that Katie Moran wasn't a good mom. That for 11 years, she let her child play with someone she didn't think had a good parent. And what else did she start to tell you, members of the jury? She told you that her daughter knew what the combination was. She told you that her daughter knew where the gun was. And she also sat in that stand, in this stand right here, and she told you that on the day her daughter lied, she died, she lied to the police officer investigating the crime. Now, then the plaintiff called out that police officer. All he told you was he didn't know what happened on August 15th. He didn't know who shot the gun. He didn't know how the gun went off. All he told you was that there was a box of bullets on top of the safe, on top of the park family safe. And he tried to tell you about the math. He tried to tell you that these three things made Eden Duran lucky. Eden Duran never did. Well, what else did he tell you, members of the jury? He told you that it's a parent's job to discuss and talk to their child. And he, and she told you, he told you that Eden Duran talked to Jesse. He told you that Katie Duran talked to Jesse when he got in trouble at school. And he told you that that gun, and the way he moved in that gun, the danger of that gun, that was his plan. Now, for this entire trial, the plaintiff's been missing one incredibly important they tried to come up here and tell you that video games make a parent negligent. That video games 
cause a parent to be held liable for the death of an 11 year old child, members of the jury, that doesn't make any sense. But even, even if you do, even if you think that Stevie Moran, she should be brought to Jesse will stand, that's not enough. Because we took something that was called an affirmative defense. And if you go back into that deliberation room and you sit down, and you look over all of the facts that you've heard here today, you think about all of the testimony you've heard here today, you think about this, this conversation where Amy Rand warned her son, not to play with guns, you think about this combination, this thing, and this is part of what's down, you think about this file drawer that had four emergencies only, and her daughter knew that, then you think, Park family was a store that done right. You can't by being the man who's tired of it. Now, in August of 2010, Amy Park left this world. And nothing we do here today, nothing we say here today, no amount of money, no judgment. No liability could ever bring her back. Because that day, when Gary Park and her husband, they lost their daughter. And Stephen Duran and Jesse Duran, they lost their best friend. No matter what we decide here today, there are no winners. We all lost. Yourself that it's done is only as dangerous as the place is a place of kept. If you go back into that room and you think to yourself that the Park family didn't store their gun right, if you think go back into that room and you think to yourself that the danger was in the Park home and only the Park home, you can't and be alive. Members of the jury, Ms. Allen just stood up here before you and told you everything we as the plaintiff didn't want you to hear, or so the defense thinks. But she didn't stand up here and tell you what the defense doesn't want to admit. The defense does not want to admit that without Jesse Duran's obsession with firearms, Jesse wouldn't have wanted to get the gun. If the defendant had not bought these video games, the spark never would have been put in Jesse's head to play with this gun. If Hayden Duran had stepped in and said, no, Jesse, you can't play with these games anymore. It is going too far. That gun wouldn't have been brought out. They wouldn't have gone to that safe. They wouldn't have used the combination to get the gun. And Ms. Allen also stood up here and told you that on August 18th, Ms. Park drove away from her home. Well, Hayden Duran drove away from the Park home also, and Hayden Duran drove away with something that Ms. Park didn't drive away with. Hayden Duran drove away with the knowledge that Jesse wanted to play with the gun. That Jesse said, I want the gun. I want the gun. Mrs. Park didn't know that. Members of the jury, today when you go back to deliberate, you have to use both your heart and your head. You have to consider both emotion and evidence. With an 11 year old girl who's dead, and Hayden Duran was responsible for this by never stepping in and taking any action to control her child. A gun is not as dangerous as the home it is kept in. A gun is as dangerous as someone who wants to play with it. Find the leader in five.